So if we go back, go now to specifics of the talk today, Tim, if you would move there. So yeah, today um, I have the pleasure to, to welcome to this webinar series, talk about secondary ion mass spectrometry, uh, Dr. Tim Spiller. Uh, Tim has got his uh, bachelor's degree in engineering in uh, Penn State University. And then 2001, he got PhD in University of Illinois. He had worked by, uh, in 1998 at Motorola Labs. And then he has joined the, among other positions he has uh, held before, held before, he actually joined the MRL in 2004. So he has been the director of assists between 2010, 2011, 2015 as well. He is a senior research scientist at the MRL. He has like more than 20 years experience work with SIMS. In addition to of being responsible for our SIMS capability, especially time of flight SIMS, Tim is also responsible for other ion based, ion beam based techniques in the MRL. Uh, the, our peloton accelerator, where you have the Rutherford RBS, Rutherford backscattering spectrometry, RBS, and our new Kamika LIP 5000 excess atom probe tomography. Uh, we hope those will be topics of, 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 of upcoming webinars in the future from Tim. But today we're going to actually have the pleasure to have Tim here talk about SIMS. Tim, thank you very much for making the time to prepare this talk and again, share with your, with your experience on that. So I welcome you. And again, thanks for doing this presentation. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, I assume that everyone here can hear me just fine. Um, I'll be giving an introduction on SIMS and showing examples of the types of results that can be achieved with the technique. Personally, my first use of SIMS was as a graduate student back in the late 90s. Our research group was growing boron, phosphorus, and arsenic doped silicon and silicon germanium thin films by gas source molecular beam epitaxy, and we used SIMS to determine our dopant concentrations. Uh, as Mara said, I became the staff member responsible for SIMS in about 2005 and have been teaching, training, and maintaining the systems ever since. <clears throat> SIMS is an analytical technique where we bombard the surface with primary ions, which have an energy of about 1 keV to 25 keV, and measure the mass of the secondary ions that come off the surface. Um, some of the key advantages of SIMS include the ability to examine isotope differences, sensitivity to hydrogen and lithium, and the high sensitivity and large dynamic range in detection. In this presentation, I will cover instrumentation of SIMS systems as well as analysis modes. I will also show many varied examples of results that can be obtained by the technique. You've probably seen this Evans Analytical Group smart chart uh, in many of these webinars, that's because it's a very useful tool for categorizing techniques by lateral resolution and atomic sensitivities. As you can see here, SIMS and TOF SIMS occupy a significant area in the plot due to the large compositional range of detection. SIMS can regularly determine concentrations in the PPM regime with PPB concentrations available under certain conditions. There are three major classes of mass spectrometers that are used for SIMS analysis. The quadrupole mass spectrometer consists of four parallel rods, which are energized by RF and DC voltages to limit the passage of ions to only the ones with the correct mass to charge ratio. They're often used in residual gas analyzer systems. The advantages of this system include its small size and low cost. It can easily be fitted with an ionizer to enhance the signal to the detector. A disadvantage is that it has poor mass resolution, about one AMU. Therefore, it can't distinguish between signals from uh, CO or N2, which both occur at 28 uh, atomic mass units. It's also not designed for imaging. The magnetic sector SIMS uses a continuous primary beam which is usually carbon or uh, cesium or oxygen, and then a secondary beam, which is accelerated from the sample by an immersion lens and is energy and mass separated in the spectrometer. This design has high throughput, which leads to very high detection sensitivity, as well as high mass resolution. 
The secondary ion optics allows the system to be used in a scanning ion microprobe mode, like you would say an SEM, or as an ion microscope, like you would use like a TEM. The combination of the electron multiplier and the Faraday cup gives over seven orders of magnitude in the dynamic range of the detection system. Disadvantage of this system is that it's expensive, over a million dollars, and has a limited mass range, about 280 AMU. And it can only measure one mass at a time. This last problem, though, can be minimized by switching between masses of interest, but that does require the operator to pre-select the masses to be analyzed. The third major type of SIM spectrometer is used in is used as a time of flight sim. In this system, a pulsed ion beam is impinged on the sample surface, and this allows for a group of secondary ions to be generated all at the same time. These secondary ions are then accelerated by the immersion lens and mass separate in the flight tube. Our TRIF-3 time of flight sims uses a gold germanium alloy in the analytical liquid metal ion gun to produce gold plus ions and ion clusters. The advantages of TOF SIMS is high mass resolution and high sensitivity. The sensitivity is about within an order of magnitude of what could be achieved in a magnetic sector instrument. But unlike the magnetic sector instrument, you get a full mass spectrum which eat with each pulse of primary ions. The pulses are rastered over the scan area and thus you get a full mass spectrum for each point in your image. Effective mass ranges go from zero to one or 2000 AMU. The disadvantage of the TOF SIMS includes a slower analysis than magnetic sector systems and depth profiling usually requires the use of a second ion gun, which means that care must be taken if you have very thin layers. The cost is also in the greater than $1 million range for a well-equipped system. This slide shows a generic block diagram of a SIMS instrument. There is an ion source for the primary ions. Cesium and oxygen are traditionally used for semiconductor work, while new materials like gold and bismuth are used for other analysis. The sample is placed after the ion source and must be vacuum compatible. It is best if it is conducting, but the use of low energy electron guns and ion guns will allow for some insulating samples to be measured. The secondary ions are acceler accelerated by an immersion lens through an energy analyzer and a mass spectrometer to a detector. The types of results that you can get include mass spectra, depth profiles, ion images, and even image 3D ion image depth profiles. The production of the primary ion beam is one of the main features required for high mass resolution and high lateral resolution in a top SIMS instrument. This is a block diagram of a generic ion source. The first part of the gun is the liquid metal ion source over here. This is similar to what you would find in a focused ion beam system. Initially, gallium was used in these ion guns, but that then progressed to indium and gold. Bismuth is currently preferred, the currently preferred material due it, to it being monoisotopic, there's only one isotope for bismuth, and that it is easy to produce large clusters. So bismuth two, bismuth three are very easy pr to produce. The ions are then admitted from the tip by a high voltage between the tip and the extractor, about 6,000 volts, and this produces an extracted beam current, which will vary with the extractor voltage. Since we want to keep a constant current, and since the extractor actually asks, acts as the first lens in the system, we need a different method to keep the extraction current constant, hence the presence of the suppressor here behind the tip. This then affects um, the amount that's being extracted, but doesn't affect the focus of the beam. Deflection is done by electrostatic lenses, deflection and focusing, while the beam current to the sample can be chosen by a beam current aperture. 
One significant difference between this design and what is found on FIB's instruments is the presence of the chicane blanker right here. The purpose of the chicane blanker is used for fast pulsing of the beam. An example of the path that the ion takes of the, through the system is shown here, where you have an ion that comes through and it gets blocked by the chicane blanker when the gun is off. Uh, if you go then and apply a voltage to the chicane blanker, what you could say is the DC beam, we can then cause the ion to travel through the system to the sample. And in so doing then, you can figure out what your DC beam current would be. Uh, and knowing your pulse length, you can then calculate how much current you're delivering. Now, of course, we don't get a single ion out of the liquid metal ion source. We get a continuous beam as shown here. In order to get a pulse in the top sims, we need to pulse the voltages on the chicane blanker to let a small group of ions move on to the sample. Our gun produces pulses of ions within the 10 to 15 nanosecond size range. And this is an example. Now, as you can see from the animation, not all of the ions arrive at the same time to the sample. Because they don't arrive all at the same time, this will reduce the mass resolution of the analysis since the secondary ions will not all be created at the same time. A mechanism to affect this is the last part of the gun, which is called the buncher. And this is an example showing how this works. So of course, the role of the buncher is to accelerate the last ions through the chicane blanker relative to the first one. When optimized, all the ions arrive at the sample at the same time, as I just showed. The bunching of the beam this way can affect the spot size of the beam, though, because um, whenever you compress something in one direction, it tends to move out. So it, um, it, can, it increases the spot size of the beam a little bit. So unbunched beams are still used when you want the highest spatial resolution. The interaction between the primary ion beam and the sample surface is a complicated one. The sputtering process produces monatomic and polyato polyatomic ions and neutrals examples shown here where the dots and circles of the various atoms coming out, ions are charged, and molecules have more than one color. Um, you also get re-sputtered primary ion species, electrons, and even photons coming out. And then the sputter crater that's created has amorphous materials due to the churning that occurs during the sputtering process, um, where you have significant bond breaking from the primary beam. This is a molecular dynamics simulation from Barbara Garrison's group at Penn State to show the crystal damage and sputter due to ion impacts. Um, the yellow dot is a gallium ion which strikes the surface at 15 kB. You'll see an atom come off here. That's your sputtered atom. Um, as you can see, there's significant damage and the gallium all the way down through the sample uh, and significant atom displacements in the crystal. The second simulation here is for a larger C60 molecule striking a surface with the same total energy of 15 keV. Uh, as you can see, there's going to be significantly more material removed from the sample, including larger clusters. The damaged area also doesn't extend as far into the sample. Partially due to this work, there has been a surge in the development of large cluster sources, including massive argon clusters with 200 to 5,000 atoms in them. Large water clusters have also been shown to be useful with certain types of samples. A common type of time of flight detector that allows for energy focusing of ions is the ion reflectron. This is used in TOF sim systems from ion TOF and in many MALDI systems. MALDI is matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization. Secondary ions are accelerated away from the sample by an immersion lens. Since the energy that we've given to these ions is one half mass times velocity squared, the lighter ions achieve a faster, or, are accelerated and reach the detector faster than the heavier ones. 
um, and the heavier ones arrive later. The purpose of the reflectron here is some of these ions that come off have a different energy. They may have a little bit of energy due to the sputtering process, but we want them to hit the detector at the same time as everyone else with the same mass. And so the reflectron is able to take that into account and cause the ions of the same mass to reach the detector at the same time. This allows for more signal and thus higher sensitivity for the instrument. Second type of TOF analyzer is the triple focusing TOF or TRIFT system, which uses three electrostatic analyzers to guide the secondary ions. Like in the reflectron, the three ESAs allow for all the ions with the same mass to reach the detector at the same time. In this case, ions with a higher initial energy take a slightly longer path to reach the spectrometer. In these TOF systems, the mass resolution, i.e. how close the peaks can be, can be affected by how quickly the data can be detected. In our TRIP-3 system, the detector time slices are 138 picoseconds in length and allow for measurement separations below 1 milli AMU. A recent advance in detector design is the ability to deflect a time slice of the beam, approximately 1 AMU in size, to a collision-induced dissociation cell, CID cell, and break, break apart the molecular species. The fragments created allow for identification between different molecules that have the same mass. The top, this top top system will break the molecules into component parts, and that allows for this identification. SIMS measurements are usually done in one of two modes static SIMS or dynamic SIMS. Static SIMS uses a beam dose that affects about 1% of the surface atoms or less. It can give surface information including elemental and molecular information. Dynamic SIMS involves significantly higher doses or fluxes of uh, primary ions where you're able to then remove significant amounts of material. Um, you're more limited to elemental signals here um, but then these can be plotted as a function of depth. One of the types of analysis done in static SIMS mode is the creation of a surface mass spectra. The high resolution mass spectrometer allows for the separation of peaks from, with the same nominal mass. The example on the left shows the separation of peaks between GaOH and GaNH3. Um, which both have a nominal mass of 86 AMU and an approximate separation of about 150th of an AMU. Now, mass res resolution or resolving power has been defined for SIMS as M over delta M, where delta M is the full width half maximum of the peak. And this is done as analogous to E over delta E energy resolution in XPS systems. For a slip-based system like the Kamika magnetic, magnetic Sector Instrument, this is a constant over the full range of masses. However, for a time-of-flight system, M over delta M does vary as a function of mass, so it's important to state what mass is being used to measure the resolution. In this right pane, we can see three surface contamination peaks at a nominal mass of 39, potassium, C2HN, and C3H3. Um, the lack of a tail to lower energy um, is nice because it allows you to see this peak and it's not obscured by this one. SIMS often contains data with signals that are orders of magnitude different in intensities. Thus, SIMS results are often plotted on a logarithmic scale, logarithmic vertical axis instead of a uh, linear one. Another type of analysis that can be formed be performed in static SIMS is the formation of ion images. In this case, we have a plot of the indium signal as a function of position on the surface. Line scans can be then taken across these quantum dots to show an average size of the features, which is approximately half a micron in width. Another example of ion imaging in static SIMS 
is the imaging of an organically patterned surface. The molecule shown here will break under this wavelength of light, taking away the bromine containing part and leaving behind a sulfur containing part. By imaging both the sulfur signal and the bromine signal, we can identify the locations where the molecule is still intact and where it has been broken. The high intensity bromine signal um, that we can see in TOF SIMS was not actually able to be visible in XPS imaging, but because we were able to do the work with the SIMS, the project was able to move forward. Uh, you can use a combination of mass spectra and mass imaging um, to help out with some identification of peaks in your mass spectra. In this experiment by Eric Monroe, uh, he was able to identify the mass peak for vitamin E and had an unknown peak down here at 165 AMU, which he was able to identify as a vitamin E fragment due to the same localization of the two peaks in the uh, mass imaging that was done on this sample. Very large surface images, several millimeters in size, can be performed by using the mosaic mapping feature of the instrument, where both the ion beam and the sample stage are moved. This is a composite image of a tissue slice from a zebra finch songbird showing the localization of fatty acids. The presence in certain sections, the presence in certain sections of the brain were associated with the ability of the bird to sing. So to remind you, in static sims, we can get elemental and molecular information from a surface producing a surface mass spectrum or 2D surface images. The uh, damage is, sample damage is minimal because we keep a low ion flux, less than 1% of the surface. But to get information as a function of thickness, we'll perform dynamic measurements where the ion flux is high enough to erode the surface and information is collected at various depths. Due to the high amount of bond breaking, we are limited more to elemental analysis but we can collect mass spectra, depth profiles, and even 3D image depth profiles. This is an example of a gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide multilayer stack. The surface was analyzed with the LMIG using the 15 kilovolt gallium beam. This is followed by an O2 sputtering beam for material removal. You can see the variation of the gallium and aluminum signal with sputtering depth and the period of spacing is about two nanometers. Similar to what was presented last week by Dr. Hosh on the quantification of XPS results, we can define an equation for the quantification of SIMS where the secondary ion current is proportional to the primary particle flux, the sputter yield, the ionization probability of the sputtered particle, the fractional concentration of the particle, and the transmission of the system. A complication for the quantification of SIMS results is that while the sputter yield is, um, has a small spread from 5 to 15, the ion sputter yield, which is the ratio of ionized atoms to impinging ions, can vary by orders of magnitude. The ion sputter yield can be affected by many things, including matrix effects, surface coverage of reactive elements, background pressures in the sample environment, orientation of the sample surface, and angle of emission of detected secondary ions. Thus, first principle predictions of ion sputter yields is not possible. However, quantification is possible with the use of appropriate standards. With that known, though, we can take advantage of things like the matrix effects, surface coverage, and background pressures to increase the ion sputter yield to give us higher sensitivity to lower concentrations in the samples. And that's how we can get PPM and PPB sensitivity. Since the sputtered atoms need to ionize for them to be measured, 
The relative electronegativity of the atoms affect how easy it is to make an atom into a positive or negative secondary ion. This periodic table shows whether an atom prefers to be a positive or a negative ion, with those preferring to be positive in orange and those preferring to be negative in blue. We can use a sputtering gun, oxygen or cesium, to enhance the signal of these ions. Oxygen enhances the formation of positive secondary ions, while cesium enhances the formation of negative secondary ions. Some elements are not well enhanced by either cesium with negative secondary ions or oxygen with positive secondary ions. But in these cases, it's been determined that the analysis of a positive cluster ion containing cesium and the element of interest, for instance, cesium plus cadmium or cesium plus zinc, can produce higher sensitivities. These are shown in yellow. To be quantitative in SIMS, we need to have a standard sample which has the same matrix material as our unknown sample and a known concentration of our species of interest. If we have that, we can define a relative sensitivity factor, an RSF, as the ratio of counts between the matrix material to the counts from the species of interest times the atomic density of the material of interest. In the semiconductor industry, ion implantation of dopant materials is a usual way of producing standard samples, and this will produce a Gaussian profile, which can be an analyzed <coughs> to produce the RSF. The plots in this slide show a, a phosphorus implant sample that was run under both an oxygen beam and a cesium beam. The raw data over here on the left in counts per second uh, shows that the phosphorus signal is enhanced by over one order of magnitude when we use the oxygen beam compared to the cesium beam. However, with the proper use of the standard sample, the data from both measurements can be quantified for concentration and the quantified, uh, and they do overlap. Um, the O2 data has a lower noise level and can measure lower concentrations though. So there is an advantage to using the correct thing uh, when you have the option. If you're trying to measure both boron and phosphorus at the same time though, you're often better using the uh, oxygen, um, the cesium beam to help you set that up. The procedure for depth pro profiling in the TOF sims does require the alignment of both the analysis gun and the material removal gun. Ideally, we would prefer to have a crater that has a square bottom where we are at the same depth for all points in the crater. However, a more realistic crater shape has some curvature to it. But we can restrict the analysis area where we collect the data about the middle 10 to 20% to avoid the influences of the crater shape and any sidewall effects. When done correctly, you can see a, the nice profile of diffused neodymium oxide in the uranium oxide thin film. However, if you're not able to get a nice alignment of the two ion guns, our analysis area could be from the slope portion of the crater. This will lead to a result that does not represent the actual dopant profile in the sample. This is an example that shows the high sensitivity and large dynamic range that is possible in a SIMS depth profile. This scan is from a boron modulated doped silicon layer grown by gas source molecular beam epitaxy where the diborane flux was increased for each section. SIMS was used to accurately determine the amount of boron doping in the doped and undoped layers. The SIMS results also show that surface segregation of boron that occurs after the boron flux is turned off, uh, and you can see that here by this where it doesn't go all the way back to zero. It does here, but not here, and not here, and not here. Um, and this effect increases with increasing boron doping level. From this data, the boron surface segregation during gas source MBE growth was able to be accurately modeled. This is another example of quantitative analysis in SIMS. 
Here we have a gallium arsenide layer grown by MLCBD and doped with alternating layers of carbon and silicon. The SIMS is also able to show an unintentional hydrogen passivation uh, of acceptors that occurred during growth. In these profiles, we can observe that the carbon and silicon concentrations change by at least three orders of magnitude, while we show six orders of magnitude in concentration in the plot. We're also able to observe the hydrogen concentration. Uh, annealing of the sample led to a diffusion and desorption of hydrogen from the topmost carbon layer, carbon doped layer. Because SIMS measures the mass of secondary ions, you can also do isotopic analysis for mass diffusion experiments. In this experiment, the nickel-3 aluminum alloy sample was oxidized by four hours in 1802, followed by 16 hours in 1602. Atomic concentrations were measured using Auger electron spectroscopy uh, depth profiles while the SIMS was used to analyze the isotope differences. These results show that both the nickel and the oxygen diffuse within the sample, while the aluminum does not, leading to this profile. This example shows the use of SIMS for probing the presence of dopants in etched silicon nanowire arrays. A problem arises when etching highly doped wafers um, the process produces undesirable porous structures. Uh, so the alternative that they uh, followed here was to etch the arrays first and then attempt to dope them. Previous work showed that we can dope the nanowires using spin-on dopants without significantly affecting the underlying substrate. In this work, we used the SIMS to quantify the enhanced doping concentration at the tips. So here you can see we have enhanced doping uh, and then it falls off as you go in, uh, which was the enhanced doping at the tips was used to lower the specific contact resistivity to the nanowire array. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, a high sputtering beam can produce significant intermixing of the surface layer. This can destroy near surface structures that are of interest to the researcher. However, a minimum energy is needed to do the SIMS analysis. A unique solution for this problem exists in top SIMS because we can use a high current but low energy 2 to 3 kilovolt cesium beam for material removal and a low dose but high energy gold beam for SIMS analysis. This experiment explores the interaction of charged point defects in the near surface region on bulk diffusion of a biased sample. The samples are annealed in natural abundance O2 and then with isotopically enhanced 18O2. And using the ability to, of SIMS to examine the isotopic differences as a function of depth allowed the researchers to determine the amount of surface pileup of the 18 oxygen due to the band bending. Last week, Dr. Hosh so, showed how XPS was used in lithium ion battery work. We have also used SIMS to help determine pathways for impedance rise in the lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries consist of a graphite negative electrode, a lithium containing positive electrode with nickel, cobalt, manganese, and an LiPF6 electrolyte. The SIMS results show that the manganese from the lithium containing a uh, positive electrode travels through the electrolyte and deposits on the graphite negative electrode. This then results in an impedance rise in the battery. Additional experiments were performed with a four nanometer alumina coating applied to the positive electrode. This coating was found to inhibit the impedance rise at the negative electrode. And the SIMS results showed that the coating inhibited the dissolution of transition metal ions, reducing the occurrence of lithium consuming side reactions. TOF SIMS has also been used in examining the wear tracks from friction testing. These results show an example of a diamond like carbon coated steel after testing. We have the DLC coated ball and a DLC coated disc that were rubbing against each other. 
The ion images are color coded with oxygen in red and carbon in green. And the overlay images show the enhanced oxygen signal that occurs at the edges of the wear track on the disc. Information from the wear track experiments can also be determined as a function of sputtering depth. In this slide, we show a movie created from the depth profile data of several hydrocarbon signals, as well as hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen-rich phases of C2H2 accumulates in the wear track, which decreases the sliding friction. This slide shows a quick comparison between OJ electron spectroscopy, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and both dynamic and time of flight SIMs. OJ and XBS measure the energy of electrons and are generally good for concentrations of 0.1% and higher. SIMs uses, a primary, uses primary and secondary ions and is best for concentrations below 1%, but can measure down to the parts per million range. While well, OGE and XPS are semi-quantitative without, sem without standards, uh, SIMS requires the use of standard samples to get concentration values. All the techniques can get elemental information, but XPS can get information on chemical bonding, while TOF SIMS can acquire molecular information on surfaces. XPS and TOF SIMS are useful for analysis, are both useful for analysis of organic samples um, and uh, can do some work with insulating samples as well. I'd like to encourage you to come back next Thursday when Dr. Julio Suarez and Kathy Walsh will be presenting a seminar on 3D optical profilometry. You can register at go.illinois.edu slash MRL webinars. If you have SIMS needs, feel free to contact me at this email address. We can work right now on planning experiments and then be ready to run them once the restrictions are lifted. Finally, MRL is part of the Big Four webinar series. More information and registration can be found at go.illinois.edu slash MRL Big Four webinars. Next Monday, Dr. Rick Hosh will be presenting a talk on the surface characterization and modification of lithium ion battery material. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Are you anything else to add now? Tim? No, thank you. I'm available for questions. All right. Uh, before we move to questions, uh, a few common uh, tech questions we get here is about the Availability of the presentation with slides. I suggest you contact him directly about that. He will decide on that. Uh, second item is that we have been recording these webinars. Uh, this particular webinar team is going to review uh, the quality of the recording. And if he approves, we're going to post uh, both in our uh, MRL webinar website that you see uh, the, the, the web link there. Also in our YouTube MRL facilities uh, channel. We have a few questions to go on here, Tim. Uh, first one is that for, you, you mentioned about like advances in type of sources. How easy or practical is to upgrade like existing instrument or a bit more legacy instruments to, to, to add, for example, a bismuth source? Um, that can be very dependent on the instrument you're working from. Um, our instrument, the, the source, we have a, physical limitation on how big it can be. Some of these new sources are longer and such we would not be able to physically fit it in. Some okay. of the newer systems, they don't have that physical limitation. So it's just a matter of unbolting one source, bolting on another one and having the uh, proper computer control. So on the newer systems, it's much nicer in that regard. Good. Uh, another question is about sample damage. Can you comment about and compare the sample damage from the bismuth source with, with the damage from a cluster source or a gallium source? So as I showed in those videos, the gallium source um, produces very deep damage, lots of, lots of ion motion just to get a few ions out. Um, the advantage of using a cluster source like a bismuth three cluster um, for analysis is that you get a lot more out and 
also things of larger mass. Um, the sputtering uh, ability for large, you get more sputtered ions out when you are better mass match to what you're trying to see. So if you're trying to see bigger um, molecular clusters coming off, you'll want to use something with a higher molecular weight uh, to sputter it with. The <clears throat> C60 gun is generally used for material removal, but I, I believe it can also be used for SIMS work. The difficulty of, of course, with all these is making a nice short pulse. That's much easier to do with something like bismuth. So a lot of times the cesium, the C60, is used for removing material. C60 is used for removing material. And then the bismuth or the gold would be used for analyzing the surface. I see. Thank you. Uh, another question is about the, uh, can, can, does the chemical composition change due to the ion bombardment? And can, we, can it act to be identified? So, I was a uh, co-author on a paper where we were looking at um, aluminum concentration in a titanium aluminum nitride thin film. And the difficulty that you have with some materials is preferential sputtering. And um, so if I were to look at that in say a uh, Toff Sims or say an OJ, you would preferentially sputter the aluminum away and so you wouldn't get the right concentration of aluminum to titanium. But because we were using our Kamika sims where we're analyzing everything as we sputter it away, um, we were able to get a better accurate measurement. But yes, certain materials sputter differently and so you can have difficulties with measuring the uh, concentrations. Fortunately, under normal conditions, we're using standards to uh, help us with the quantification, so things even out that way. Okay. Are there challenges for thin film, uh, thin polymeric systems? Challenges for thin, well, one of the challenges you tend to face with polymers is that they are not, a lot of them are not good electrical conductors, and that uh, makes it more difficult to collect the data. You can usually um, get something from them um, by use of an electron gun. Um, one of the nice things about the TOF SIMS, the way the electron neutralization works is you've sent in a pulse of ions and while you're waiting to do the collection of the data, you can send in uh, electrons at low energy and they neutralize the surface, at which point then you can send in a new pulse. And so you're able to keep the keep yourself from building up surface charge because the ions coming in have a positive charge. Um, so that's one thing with respect to polymers that uh, I have found from my experience. Um, the other thing is, unless you're doing surface measurements, it, it's very hard to get molecular information except from the very top surface. Um, that's the big uh, hope from the molecular, um, the bigger, uh, cluster ions, the big argon clusters work well for some materials that allows you to do molecular, inf to keep getting molecular information even as you go deeper and deeper. Um, one of the nice things is with those cluster sources, they're useful both in SIMS research and XPS research. Um, and so a uh, big advantage with respect to that. Okay. Uh, one comment here or a question is that uh, so some of the attendees really appreciate the slide comparing the different techniques. I'm not sure if they're talking about the last table uh, where you compare SIMS with XPS or the, the one with Evans bubble chart. Uh, they are asking if they could have access to that so they can use in their teaching courses. Uh, I would say the best way is to just email team directly to be able to, to share some of that information with you. Uh, one more question is that what's the Z resolution when do, doing that profile? get the depth resolution. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things is that um, because we independently control the uh, analysis and the sputtering time, how long we sputter for and how big of an area we're sputtering over, we can get, have big steps or we can have very small steps that we're looking at between sputtering events. Effectively though, with the intermixing, 
you're you're down to I would say one to ten nanometers um, would be the the finest you could do with respect to um, step uh, analysis. Just like a spot size, you've got a limited lateral mm -hmm. resolution related to spot size. That one to ten nanometer mixing level um, okay. is comes in. Okay. Uh, like we got a question last week about the use of XPS in liquid materials, liquid samples. Can you comment on that for availability of that for SIMS? Is there any progress on that? I have never attempted a liquid sample in SIMS. And in my SIMS, it would be impossible because the samples sit vertically. Some of the newer top SIMS, they sit horizontally. Um, I think the best situation you could do and we have a, a cryo stage available, would be to find a way to freeze the sample and then look at it in the solid state um, because the uh, vacuum and liquids uh, don't work very well. Mm -hmm. Now, one final question I have. I know that typically 2D uh, ion imaging is time consuming, but you also mentioned that some people are doing actually as a function of that, like a 3D ion image. That is going to be very time consuming, right? Actually, not so much. Um, because the uh, pulse lengths are so short and we get so many of them, the 2D ion imaging is, you get that automatically when you do your measurement. Uh, and you can get a reasonably good ion image, 2D ion image in 10, 15 minutes of analysis time. The, uh, now, if you want to go big with a mosaic mapping, that's a different story. With, when we do depth profiling, we limit, significantly limit the size of the area that we're taking data from to like 50 or 100 microns. And so that allows us to have a, um, to, to, to make a uh, depth profile in a reasonable amount of time. And since the machine collects all this information and stores it in a raw file, you have access to it. You can go back. You can actually pick other peaks after the fact that you didn't know to look for in the top sims to be able to make additional images or um, concentration profiles. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, any more comments, Tim? No, no, I think, right. I think we're good. Okay, thank you, Julie, for organizing this event. Tim, thanks for the excellent presentation. Anyone has additional questions, please contact him directly through the email. Uh, don't forget for next week, two very brand new talks, one with Rick on uh, batteries using XPS. And on Thursday, again, same time, same place, 3D optical uh, profilometry. Uh, it's a technique that we have not covered before in webinars, brand new next week. Thank you. Ev thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, watch out for the video of this talk being available soon. And... Stay safe and keep in touch with us. Take care. Bye.